the body needs rest. Fully human, the Lord Jesus recognizes that. But he also recognizes that the soul needs rest as well. So what our good shepherd Jesus does is he provides rest for his people, for his sheep, by teaching them his eternal truth and leading them to the quiet peace that is found in our God. I'm Paul Zell, along with our pastor in training, Vicar Tommy Welch. I'm pleased to lead you in worship today as we recognize what our shepherd does as he feeds, guides, and leads our souls to eternal life in him. May the Lord bless your worship today as you listen attentively to his holy word. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Father in heaven, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin. For faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do, you should cast me away from your presence forever. O Lord, I'm sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in and with Christ and has restored to us the joy of our salvation. So in the name of the Lord Jesus and by his authority, I say to you what God says. Your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, the strength of all who trust in you, mercifully hear our prayers. Be gracious to us in our weakness and give us strength to keep your commandments in all we say and do. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Throughout Holy Scripture, the word shepherd is used for those people whose work is to feed, guide, protect, comfort, and lead those who are the Lord's sheep. At the time of the prophet Jeremiah, many shepherds were unfaithful to the task and the sheep were being scattered by the very words that those shepherds were telling them. So through the prophet, the Lord says that he himself will shepherd his sheep, that he will guide them by the new shepherds that he provides. The Old Testament lesson from the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 23. Woe to those shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to the shepherds who tend my people. Because you've scattered my flock and driven them away and have not bestowed care on them, I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you have done, declares the Lord. I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and will bring them back to their pasture, where they will be fruitful and increase in number. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them, and they will no longer be afraid or terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. The days are coming, declares the Lord when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. 
This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord, our righteous Savior. The word of the Lord. Those who shepherd the Lord's flock, the teachers and pastors of God's people, are to imitate Christ and themselves be imitated in what they teach and in what they do. They work under the authority of Jesus Christ himself, the great shepherd of the sheep. We hear this from the second reading, the epistle to the Hebrews chapter 13. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. Pray for us. We are sure that we are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. I particularly urge you to pray so that I may be restored to you soon. Now, the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. The Lord Jesus himself shepherds his sheep by teaching them all that they need and by giving them rest for their souls. The Gospel of the Day from St. Mark, chapter 6, the basis also for the sermon today. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Everybody knows how to do it. And you do too. It's actually one of the most basic human needs and you can't function without it. It's rest. So much of our lives are dedicated around that basic human need called rest. So we're actually pretty good at it. When you're tired, you know exactly what to do. You sleep for multiple hours a day. Just like when you need a break from your daily life or from your job, you take a vacation in order to rest. Schools even take three months out of the year so that teachers and students have an opportunity to rest. Everybody knows what to do in order to rest. You know, in the last year and a half or so, people have had more time to rest than ever before. Yet anxiety and depression is through the roof. And there's no indication that those statistics will plateau at any point in the near future. You see, you and I, we know how to rest our bodies. It's, it's obvious to us. Just as if you were to start running and you're lungs would start to burn and your legs would get tired, that would mean that your brain is sending off signals, alarms, letting you know that if you want this uncomfortable sensation to stop, all you got to do is stop running and rest. But it's not always so obvious when to rest. 
our souls. It's not always so obvious how we would even go about doing that, how we would rest our souls. That's why Jesus speaks to you today in the words from Mark chapter 6, so that you would know just when it is that you need to rest, spiritually speaking, and just so that you would know how to rest your soul. It's from these words that Jesus tells you to always go back to him for rest when you're tired. That's what his disciples did. Jesus sent his disciples on individual missions where they would go apart from Jesus to preach in his name, to, to even heal people in his name, to perform miracles. This was amazing, exciting work. I mean, could you imagine looking somebody in the eyes as you heal them from some disease? This was exciting stuff. But it was also exhausting. You can almost imagine once word got out that Jesus' disciples too, now they have the power to, to heal sick people. You can almost imagine how the crowds would begin pressing around them on every side where people who needed rest from their physical pain and ailments would do whatever it took to get close to these disciples. How the disciples, if they wanted to go anywhere to the next side of the town, they would have to fight through desperate crowds. The days were long, the sun was hot. Who knows if they had a place to sleep, if they even really slept much at all. What we do know is what the text says, and the text tells us from Matthew 6 that they didn't even have enough time to eat because there were so many people that were coming and going. Yes, this was amazing, exciting work, but it was exhausting, and they were tired. They needed rest, and so they go back to Jesus. And before they get rest, they tell him everything that they did. They reported all the good news, all the things that they had seen, all the things that they had said. But that's not the only reason they came back to Jesus. They came back to Jesus because, well, they had to. The disciples, they couldn't go on preaching forever. They couldn't go on healing people. I mean, you can only work without eating for so long. And so they were tired, and they stood before Jesus, and it was obvious that they were in need of rest. And so what did Jesus tell them? Well, Jesus gave them the rest that they so desperately needed, but he did not do it by sending them off to their homes, saying, okay, go home for a while, lift your feet up, take a load off, maybe go off by yourself, do whatever you think you need to do in order to get rest, and then come back to me, and we'll meet here later. No, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus did not send them away from himself. That would be ridiculous. Because Jesus was the only person that could possibly have given them rest. Because Jesus was the only person, the person that gave them the ability to do all those things in the first place. This is what Jesus said to them. Not go away from me and get rest. He said, come with me. Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Because there's this common weakness that all people share, that I share with you and we share with the disciples, that as our bodies age, as time goes by, we wear down. We share this common weakness that the obligations from our families, the obligations from our work, from our careers, they wear us down too. We share this common weakness that patience runs dry or with the ones that are closest to us. We share this common weakness that we do not have the stamina to withstand the constant barrage of di life's daily struggles. We just don't. You and I, we break down. We need rest. We break down physically, of course, but we also break down spiritually. I mean, if we're honest with ourselves, we can look at our lives and see how this has taken place. Let me ask you, has there ever been a time when you just totally felt on fire for God's word? Maybe it was after a sermon or, or coming to church. Maybe it was after a video like this, except that fire for God dwindled away maybe by the next afternoon, maybe even earlier. Has there ever been a time 
when your church attendance was a given. It was automatic that you would be here, or it was automatic that you would be watching these videos. Only after some time that attendance in church or your faithfulness to God's word somehow has now become sporadic. Do you ever start the day with a grateful, content attitude only to watch it devolve into something maybe related to bitterness or impatience with someone or something? Yes, you and I, we break down. We get tired. We need rest. And when Jesus finds you broken down and in need of rest, he does not come up to you and he does not say, okay, stand up, shake it off, rub some dirt on it and try harder. No, he doesn't do that. He doesn't send you away either. He doesn't send you to go off somewhere to get rest and say, okay, do whatever you got to do and come back to me when you're better. No, he doesn't tell you to go to the place that you think there is rest to be found. No, he brings you to the one and the only place where true rest is found. The only place that you need to go. It's with him. Jesus says to you, come with me by yourself to a quiet place and I will give you rest. And what is this quiet place? What does it look like? It's not in a boat in the Sea of Galilee like maybe the disciples. It's not on the couch in front of a TV. It's not another vacation. No, this quiet place with Jesus, it could be on your kitchen table before you start the day with God's word open before you. This quiet place, it could be a daily devotion, whether with yourself or with your family members. This quiet place could be any time throughout your day when you remember a passage from God's word that reminds you of his goodness, of his faithfulness, and of his grace. Whatever it is, this place is quiet. It's quiet because the only thing you're going to be listening to is Jesus in his word. And so this quiet place, it's the word of God, and Jesus brings you there. And in this quiet place, you hear all about what Jesus has done. You read all about the times when Jesus was so on fire for God's, for God's will and followed God's law faithfully and with a perfect attitude every single day. This quiet place, it's in God's word where you read about how Jesus preached with people lovingly, showed them kindness and was patient with them, healed them every single day and never ran out of stamina, but only loved them all the time. It's in God's word, this quiet place where you read about how Jesus worked himself into the ground, literally into the grave for you. But he did not just do all this work for himself. No, in this quiet place with Jesus, you read that his work, everything he did, was for you. This quiet place, God's word, it's, it takes you to the cross where you see Jesus bow his head down and take his last breath. In that quiet place, you see Jesus die for you. You see him rest from all his work. But this was not a rest just for himself. This rest was not for Jesus. No, Jesus rested on the cross. He died on the cross for you. Jesus died there for you so that in his death, you would have life. He became weak there so that you would have strength in this life and in the next. On the cross, Jesus bowed his head, took his last breath, and rested for you so that you would have rest, not just for the difficult days of this life, but so that you would have rest forever and ever. You see, this is the rest that Jesus gives you every single day when you meet him in that quiet place in his word. It's the rest that's not just for now, but forever. And this is the type of rest that the disciples received from Jesus. They got in the boat. They were on the Sea of Galilee in that quiet place 
away from all the people, finally some peace and quiet, finally some food maybe, finally a little bit of rest. Except as they started to get a little bit closer to the other side, they noticed something on the shoreline. It was, I don't know, people, more people. And as they got even closer and closer, they began to realize just how obnoxiously loud this crowd really was. 5,000 people, 5,000 men, not including women and children, the same group of people that Jesus would later feed with five loaves of bread and two fish. This crowd was bigger than any group of people they saw on their own individual missions. And so you can imagine what was going through the disciples' mind when they saw these people. Oh, no. <laughs> not again. When am I going to be able to eat next? It's probably not going to be until tomorrow, and I'm probably not going to be able to sleep very much tonight because there's going to be a whole lot to do. You have got to be kidding me. You can understand how the disciples might feel as they saw that large crowd of people. I mean, you know what it's like. At the end of a long day, when you finally get to sit down and the lazy boy maybe put the feet up, when you finally get the dishes done, when you finally put the laundry away, when everything's finished and you're about to turn on your show or about, you're about to open up that book, and then the doorbell rings. And you go to see who's there, and it's your family member with her eight children. Surprise, they've come to visit you and they say they're going to be spending the week with you. That's what this crowd was like for the disciples. Uninvited, a nuisance, too large to handle. You know, in this, this crowd, they, they didn't necessarily come to see Jesus with the greatest motives. They most likely were thrill seekers. They wanted to, an adventure. Maybe they wanted to see a miracle. They didn't want to come to Jesus to receive rest necessarily. That would be like those family members coming to your house, telling you that, well, they didn't really want to see you. They just wanted to swim in your pool for the week. You would be annoyed. You would be maybe even a little upset. You might even just tell them to leave. Yeah, this crowd was unruly. They had their faults. They were broken. Maybe they didn't even have the right motives. Yet when they came rushing towards Jesus, he did not turn the boat away from them and steer the other way, although he very well could have. He did not shoo them away. No. Jesus saw this crowd and he gave up his privacy. He gave up his own rest. He gave up his own disciples' rest and his time with them because he had compassion on them. And he began to teach them many things. He had compassion on them, the text says, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. The moment that Jesus locked eyes on this crowd, his stomach was in knots to the point of grief because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Sheep without a shepherd are constantly in danger. Sheep without a shepherd don't know where to find food. They can't find water. They wander obliviously into danger. Sheep certainly do not know how to find rest on their own. And so when Jesus saw all these people, he had compassion on them, and he knew that he had to do something, because if he didn't, their souls would be lost forever too. So he had compassion. I had somebody... A father actually explained to me what that sort of compassion is like. His daughter had been suffering from migraines for quite some time. And on one particular night, in the middle of the night actually, the migraine was so horrendous, it was so unbearable that they had to take her into the emergency room. And when they took her into the emergency room, the doctors did a few tests and they quickly concluded that the best course of action was to do emergency surgery to remove a tumor the size of a baseball. Nobody knew if she was going to survive the procedure. They didn't know if she was going to be the same after the procedure, and she was only 11 years old. This father told me how that night 
he prayed for his daughter and didn't sleep at all. And actually didn't sleep for a couple nights, but as his daughter's life was in the balance, and they didn't know if she was going to make it, he prayed for her, asking God that if there, it was in any way possible that it could be him instead of her. He told me that during that time, he had compassion on his daughter. You know, when Jesus sees you coming to him with all your faults and with all your weaknesses and with everything that's wrong with you, he could very easily roll his eyes, turn the other way, and maybe even justifiably so. He could look at you and say, oh no, not again. This person, I just gave them rest a few minutes ago and they're already coming back. <laughs> but that's not what Jesus does. When Jesus sees you coming to him, he embraces you as if you were God's own daughter or son because that is what you are. It is nothing short of a miracle that God himself in the form of Jesus would look upon sinners like you and me lost sheep with everything that is wrong with us and do whatever it took to make sure that we would not fall into harm's way. He had compassion. You know, it's been a few years since that little girl has survived her surgery. And thanks be to God, she survived the surgery with no complications. God had compassion on her. But her father would agree that the greatest display of love that God has shown that dear child was not when he gave her rest from the physical pain, but as her father would agree, the greatest display of love is when God had compassion on her soul by sending his son Jesus into the world to, to work for her perfectly. It's when God sent his son Jesus to rest on the cross for her so that her soul would have rest forever with him in heaven. And so when you break down, when your body wears down and when your soul is tired, you know where to go. Always go back to Jesus for rest. And when you do, you know exactly how he will respond. He will be compassionate and he will embrace you. When you go to Jesus for rest, he will greet you happily. And he will always say, come with me and get some rest. The prayer of the church. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, shepherded by you, we lack nothing that we really need. <clears throat> so in your loving care, Lord, lead us to... <clears throat> to live without worrying, to be filled with contentment, to be satisfied with your grace. Give each of us an ear to listen to your voice and holy scripture, and then calm us with your quiet peace. Restore those who wander into sin and retrieve those who stray from your guidance. Do so for your holy name's sake and in keeping with your promises. Be patient, good shepherd, as you direct us to walk in the righteous ways of God to the glory of your name. Stay by the side of the hurting, the lonely, the troubled, the grieving, and the dying. Feed them with the message of love and forgiveness. Strengthen them in faith. Use each of us to share your word with them so that they too might dwell in your heavenly home forever. Hear us, Lord Jesus, in keeping with your promises as we join together in the prayer that you've taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. So good to worship with you today, to be fed together with you by the word that comes from our good shepherd. I pray that each of you might find a way this week to continue in the word and follow the lead of the one who leads you to eternal life. Each week at Living Savior, Monday or Tuesday, we send out what's called the, the Week of Grace. Invite you to watch for that in your email box, or if you don't receive it, to subscribe to it simply by going to the, to the bottom of the front page of our website. There you'll find information about our ministries, our Bible studies, other events that are going on so that you can stay connected with our work. Thank you also for supporting our ministry with your prayers and with your offerings. If you'd like to give using our online offering method, you can simply go to our website, our church website, lsavior.org. Go to the giving tab and follow the instructions that are given to you there. May our good shepherd continue to feed you, guide you, protect you, and bless you this week.